the exercise I gave you uh, has convinced you that there are, in fact, two creation stories in Genesis. The question is why? And the answer has to do with how um, the Bible came to be written. A lot of people picture it as all coming down at once on a golden chain from heaven, and that's just not the case. There's a long and complex history behind the composition of the books that uh, make up uh, our Bibles. And these two creation stories come from two different parts of the Hebrew community. The first one, scholars attribute to a source they call P, uh, for priests. Um, this is associated with the priests who um, functioned in the temple. And uh, you can kind of see in it maybe the uh, religious commercial for the observance of the Sabbath. The, the second creation story comes from uh, a source that scholars call J. Uh, and the J has two meanings. One is Judah. Uh, it's a, a source from the southern kingdom of Judah, more about Israel, uh, Israel's history uh, in later lessons. Um, but also... J, um, the scholars who first analyzed these sources were German, and J is the first letter of Yahweh, the way that they would spell it. Um, J in, in uh, German is pronounced Y. In fact, the letter is called Jot in, uh, in German because it uses the proper name of Israel's God, Yahweh, uh, often translated in English Bibles as the Lord, and Lord in all caps. Now, having spent that time, uh, it, when the book of Genesis came to be compiled, rather than using one of these stories, which had been circulating orally, for generations, maybe even centuries. Instead of choosing one or the other, when the book of Genesis was compiled into its present form about 400 B.C. or so, they put the two stories side by side, uh, even though there are significant differences between them. And if that seems strange to you, think about the New Testament, where there are four Gospels, four accounts of the teachings and actions of Jesus. And if you look at them carefully, they don't harmonize very well, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke which are actually related. We'll talk more about that when we get to the origins of Christianity. Uh, and John, for example, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, put the cleansing of the temple where Jesus ta uh, uh, chases the money changers and animal sellers out of the temple. They put that near the end, uh, just before his arrest, uh, leading up to the crucifixion. John's gospel puts that story all the way up at the beginning in chapter 2. Now, may I suggest to you that it's highly unlikely that Jesus did that twice. After all, if somebody came and tore up your place of worship, would you let them back in a second time? John puts the story at the beginning for a reason. He wants to make the point that what Jesus is doing is something that's completely new. It's not just a minor change in Judaism. He is starting over. So the church actually left those four accounts with their differences 
side by side rather than choosing between them or trying to harmonize them. And exactly the same thing was done when the book of Genesis was, uh, was composed into its present form. Now, to understand where we need to go with these creation stories next, we need to kind of back out and compare them to uh, the creation story of the ancient Babylonians from what is today Iraq. And rather than have you read that, I'm just going to, to tell it to you. It begins, as many ancient creation stories do, with a divine couple. The god Apsu, who represents fresh water, water you can drink, and the goddess Tiamat, who represents salt water, the ocean. And in the ancient Near East, Everywhere, from Mesopotamia, um, in what is today Iraq, the Hebrews, even the Egyptians, the, the ocean was associated with chaos. In all of their creation stories, the world begins as a watery chaos. That's even true of the first creation story in Genesis. The earth was formless and empty, darkness on the surface of the deep, and God's spirit, or God's breath, it's the same word in Hebrew, hovering over the surface of the waters. Well, in the Babylonian creation, Apsu and Tiamat uh, mingle their waters together. I'll let you figure out what that refers to. But it results in the birth of the generation uh, of the next gods. But therein comes a problem that's familiar to any of you who have small children at home. They fight, they're noisy and rambunctious, and when the baby doesn't sleep, nobody sleeps. And they're driving Apsu crazy. And so he decides to kill them. Now, I like to say that there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who thought about killing their kids and those that never had any. The difference is that most of us aren't actually going to do it. Apsu is. Well, the younger gods hear uh, uh, of this and on the theory, do unto others before they do unto you. They kill Apsu. And this makes Tiamat furious. She comes after them to destroy them. And they are terrified of her. Until one of them, Marduk, the storm god, offers to fight Tiamat for the other gods if they will make him their king. They don't want to fight her, and so they agree. And Marduk fights Tiamat, kills her, and splits her in half. From the upper half of her body, he fashions the sky, which the ancient Near East thought of as like a solid dome over the earth, kind of like the roof of the Superdome. Um, if you look at the um, the PDF uh, on Hebrew uh, visuals, you'll see a diagram of the world as they understood it. With the earth being more or less flat, with this solid dome of a sky over it. 
From the upper half of Tiamat's body, Marduk fashions the sky. From the lower half, he fashions the earth. So that heaven and earth are closely connected. They're made of the two halves of um, the goddess Tiamat's body. He takes a god who fought on Tiamat's side, named Kingu. You don't need to worry about his name. And from that hit, uh, Kingu's blood, Marduk fashions the first human being as a servant to the gods, you know, to feed them with sacrifices. Worship in the ancient world centered around the, the offering of sacrifice. Animals, um, grain, wine, beer, olive oil. Uh, you made gifts to the gods. And the idea was in Babylonian religion that the gods actually ate these. Now, the Genesis creation stories have echoes of this. First of all, in the picture of the world, basically flat with a dome of the sky above it. The King James Version of the Bible um, uses the word firmament to talk about this vault or sky. Um, hear the word firm in that? It's solid. Um, the picture... Uh, is of um, there being this solid dome with water, the waters of chaos up above it. Now, how do we know that there's water up above the sky? Well, every now and then some of it leaks through as rain. And there's also water beneath the earth. After all, if you dig a hole, you hit water. We dig wells to get water. Uh, we, If you go to um, the edge of any body of water, you walk down into the water. So um, the idea of the earth is on top of this water. Now, everybody knows that that rock and soil doesn't float, so they envision the world as being supported on pillars. And one of the great mysteries that will be mentioned in the book of Job when we get to, to that in a later lesson is what's holding up those columns at their bases. That's one echo of the Babylonian creation in the book of Genesis. The other is actually in the opening verse, or actually verse 2. Darkness was on the surface of the deep. The Hebrew word is translated as the deep. Tchachom is the Hebrew form of the name Tiamat. But here, Tiamat's not personified as a goddess. It's simply water. And while we're thinking about that, this, um, let me point out to you that, no, uh, this is, doesn't just sound like the Bible. It is the Bible. I gave you a modern translation of, of the Bible, uh, the World English Bible. Any Bible that you can read is a translation. Unless you read Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, ancient Aramaic, and Hellenistic era Greek. And my guess is that there is one person associated with this course who can read one of those languages. Uh, and that would be me. Um, one of the other hats I wear is I'm a United Methodist minister and uh, part of my seminary training, the professional degree for clergy is the Master of Divinity. Uh, I had to take New Testament um, exegesis or interpretation uh, using the Greek New Testament rather than an English translation. Um, in fact, at the time that the books that make up the Bible were being written, there was no such thing as an English language. The Bible is older than the English language. 
the King James Version wasn't even the first translation of the Bible into English. It draws on earlier English translations uh, by William Tyndale, William Coverdale, among others. So there's nothing sacred about it. It's not the Bible and everything else is fake. It is an English translation of the Bible, just like any translation of the Bible that you can read. So there are similarities between the Hebrew creation stories and the um, Babylonian creation. But what's probably more striking is the differences. Of course, there's no conflict in either of the creation stories in Genesis. There really can't be because by the time this comes to be written, the Hebrews have come to believe in one God. Now, yes, it's true that the first creation story, uh, the word that's translated as God, uh, is the Hebrew Elohim, which is a plural. I am on the end of a noun in Hebrew does the same thing that an S on the end of it does in English. It makes it plural. But by the time this is written down, Elohim is used as a singular. We do the same thing. Have you ever worn a pant? Think about the sentence, the United States has had its first African American president. You notice anything odd about the grammar of that sentence? United States is actually plural. But we use, a, use it as if it were a singular. The United States has, not United States have. Because we think of the United States as a single thing. It wasn't always that way. There was a time in our history before the Civil War and up to the Civil War when people would have said the United States have, plural. You may or may not know uh, that Confederate General Robert E. Lee was actually offered command of the Union Army. And he turned it down saying that he could not raise his hand against his native country, by which he meant Virginia. From the American Revolution up through the Civil War, people thought of the United States as a collection of separate nations, states. It's the outcome of the Civil War that led to us thinking about the United States as a single entity which is divided up into separate um, units that we call states um, to manage just like states are divided up um, into most of them counties. Louisiana of course has to be different. We have parishes. Um, but the parishes are not independent countries. Neither do we think of the states as independent countries, but there was a time when they did. There's no conflict. But more importantly, there's no sense in the, either of these creation stories of a close connection between heaven where the gods live and earth where human beings live. In the Babylonian creation, heaven and earth are made of the two halves of the gods, goddess Tiamat's body. Human beings are made from the blood of a god. And the result of that is that if something happens in one place, it will cause the same kind of thing to happen in the other. And in the Babylonian creation story, Marduk becoming king of the gods in heaven makes his city, Babylon, 
king of the cities on earth, dominant over its neighbors. And the proof that that's what that means is that the Assyrians, another Mesopotamian uh, empire, um, told exactly the same story, but in it it was their god, Ashur, who defeated Tiamat and became king of the gods. Marduk becoming king of the gods in heaven causes the same kind of thing to happen on earth. His city Babylon becomes king of the cities. Well, if it works that way, it might work the other way too. After all, would you like to depend on the Babylonian gods to look after you out of the goodness of their hearts? I think not. What we need as human beings more than anything else for the gods to do uh, in the ancient world is to make the crops grow and the livestock we reproduce because that's what we depend on for food. And all ancient civilizations were based on agriculture. Okay? That was the, their economy was based on farming. Well, how the, the goddess uh, in Babylon responsible for making the crops grow was the goddess of fertility, Ishtar. How does Ishtar make the crops grow? Well, she gives birth to this fertility. But obviously she needs to do something before she can give birth, right? So how do we get her to do that? How do we get Ishtar to have sex with her husband Dumuzi in heaven and give birth to this fertility so that our crops will grow and our livestock reproduce? The answer is a concept called sympathetic magic um, that is present in a number of ancient religions. You act out in a symbolic way what you want the gods to do for you in real life. You can get an echo of this if you ever go to, say, a football game, if we ever play football again. Um, and uh, sometimes a game comes down to a field goal attempt at the end, and the kicker kicks the ball, uh, and it looks like it's going to go far enough but it's kind of iffy about whether it's going to go between the uprights and be uh, good. And if it is, his team wins. If he misses it, he loses. What does he do? He leans the way he wants the ball to go and maybe waves his arms. And, of course, the other team is waving the other way, right? Okay. Now, modern people probably don't think that um, making that – the those kind of motions, that body language, is going to influence the flight of the ball. But in, in a world before modern science, people did. And so the ancient Babylonian would go to the temple, make um, sacrifices to uh, kind of butter Ishtar up, and then would have sex with the priestess who represents Ishtar on earth in the hope and expectation that this is going to cause her to have sex with her husband Dumuzi and so give birth to this abundance of crops and livestock on which our lives depend. <coughs> the way that you relate to the gods in the Babylonian religion is through sympathetic magic. Now in the Hebrew creation stories in the book of Genesis, there's none of that. When the first creation story talks about God forming the heavens and the earth, there's no indication of what he's making them out of or that he's making them out of anything. He just says, speaks and there it is. Kind of makes me wonder why he had to rest. I wish I could do all my work that way. Let there be learning activities on canvas. 
I have to make these videos. I have to write up all that stuff. I have to post all that. In the second creation story, when God makes the first man, Adam, a pun on the Hebrew word for dirt, there's no indication he's making this out of something divine. It's out of earth. And yeah, he does CPR and breathe the breath of life into it, but that really doesn't mean much more than he brings this piece of clay that he's molded to life. The point of that is that in the Hebrew Bible there isn't this kind of close connection between heaven and earth, between the realm of human beings and the realm of God. And so you cannot attempt to relate to the Hebrew God, Yahweh, through sympathetic magic. Rather, you relate to God through the covenant. Now, if you've heard the word covenant at all, uh, it's probably in connection with a church covenant that you have to sign in some uh, religious communities in order to join that particular community. But in fact, a covenant, covenant isn't a religious concept at all. Secular life is full of covenants. When we went to buy um, a car the last time, you know, Grambling doesn't pay me so much money that I could write a check for 20 something thousand dollars. So what do I do? I sign a, co a covenant. A covenant is simply a contract, an agreement. When buying a new car, it was spell out, I will pay X number of dollars for Y number of months, right? And keep insurance on the car. Um, so that if we wrap it around a, a telephone pole, uh, Ally Financial gets their money. What a contract does is it spells out the terms of the relationship. What each party owes to the other. I will do this, this, and this. You do that, that, and that. And that idea of the covenant is a concept on which the entire thought of the ancient Hebrews was based. What we're going to be doing for the rest of this module is looking at aspects of the covenant that Israel understood that they had with their God, Yahweh. And we'll be starting next time with continuing the crea second creation story, the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and how the idea of covenant shows up in that story, in the story of Abraham, and going forward, the story of Israel, and even how Israel comes to understand their history. So this concept of a covenant, a contract between Israel and their God, is absolutely fundamental to understanding the Hebrew culture. And for that matter, I would point out that uh, the word covenant has the same meaning as the English word testament. Uh, some Bibles, uh, Christian Bibles, divide the Bible into the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. The idea that it is through a contract, an agreement, that God and his people work out their relationship. See you next time.